Let's talk about what it would take to design models and data sets for robotics that would make it really easy for us to acquire new vision-based robotic skills with just a small amount of data. Outside of robotics, we can build classifiers, detectors, and other kinds of machine learning systems with very little data by effectively employing pre-training. Classically, the way that people have approached pre-training is by training a very large model on a large data set, like ImageNet, for example, and then maybe cutting off the top few layers and then using a much smaller data set of examples for whatever weird task they want to solve to train those top layers. And this is referred to as pre-training and fine-tuning. More recently, even more effective methods have emerged where if you train a large enough model that can somehow be prompted or can somehow be conditioned on a task, such as a language model or a clip style model, which is a vision language model where you can supply a textual string describing the task, then perhaps you can acquire tasks with only a handful of examples or even just a single textual description. Now to support all of this, the data needs to satisfy a few criteria. It needs to be diverse enough to support new tasks, and it needs to cover a significant enough portion of possible inputs so that for whatever new task the user might want to solve, the data already kind of covers that domain. The model also needs to support some functionality. It needs to be able to actually train on all this diverse data. It needs to be flexible enough to be repurposed for new tasks, and it needs to provide some kind of zero-shot support, ideally, because that would provide for the quickest way to acquire new tasks. So, what would this look like if we were to try to apply this by analogy to robotics? What kind of data set would we want and what kind of model would we want so that we could solve new robotic tasks in our own uh, setups with just a small amount of data? The data needs to be diverse enough to support my own new robot. Maybe I have a weird robot, maybe it's a variant of something in the data set, but it's very unlikely that the data set is full of data from exactly the robotic platform I have. And it needs to cover a significant portion of the behaviors that I might want. Maybe it doesn't have exactly the same behavior, but it should cover similar enough things that it's feasible to generalize. The model needs to be able to train on all this data like before and be flexible enough to be your purpose to new tasks. And it would be very nice if the model could perform at least some things in zero shot well enough to at least provide initialization, maybe just to initialize exploration for RL, for example. So Maybe some possible criteria we could imagine is that the data should contain behaviors from many different robots, because it's pretty unlikely that I'm going to have exactly the same kind of robot as in the data set. It should contain many different tasks, because I probably want my robot to do something new rather than just repeat something that was seen before. And it probably should contain many different environments, because it's very unlikely that the setup in which my robot will be operating is going to be exactly the same as the setup seen in the data. The model needs to be conditioned on some notion of a goal, like a goal image or goal text, so that it's easy for me to quickly adapt it to a new behavior. Even if it doesn't succeed in zero shot, I would at least like it to provide a good initialization, maybe to bootstrap exploration for RL. And the model needs to be well suited for fine tuning with different methods. So probably I do want to supply a little bit of data to fine tune it further, maybe some demonstrations, or maybe I would like it to fine tune autonomously with reinforcement learning. And these are things that would be really nice for the model to support. And I think it's really worthwhile to think about what it would take to do this for real, what it would take not just to provide a proof of concept that pre-training for robots works, but to actually produce a data set and a model that any robotics practitioner could load up, load up the weights, run on their robot, and immediately out of the box get some kind of result, which they could fine tune further. The thing is, if we can enable this kind of functionality, we might not even need to immediately collect a giant data set the size of ImageNet. See, the thing is, unlike other domains like computer vision and NLP, robots do collect their own data. So if we can provide some initial functionality, maybe it's okay to start small and then keep growing if we can just push all of the additional data collected by these robots that use this model back into the data set. And that's actually a capability unique to robots. So with something like the clip model or a large language model, you really need to give it all that data up front. But maybe with this, it's enough to just get something that will give that added value so that everyone wants to initialize with it and then push the experience back into a centralized data set. So today I'm going to tell you about a few things we've tried that I think represent some steps towards this direction. I don't think we've actually constructed a full thing that satisfies all those criteria I've outlined, but perhaps some of these things I'll tell you about provide some signs of life that such an idea could work. First, I'll tell you about the bridge data set and a project we did recently called Pre-Training for Robots, or PTR. This is still on a single robot, but it does have many environments and many tasks. It's not a conditional goal, but it is very centered around the notion of fine-tuning with a small amount of data for a new task. 
Then I'll talk about another bridge data project, which focuses on goal-conditioned RL. Still single robot, but now it's a model that can be prompted in zero shot to perform a new task, and then further fine-tune from there if its behavior is not satisfactory. And lastly, I'll talk about a very recent project we, we did called General Navigation Models, or GNMs, which is a navigation project where we collected data from a very wide range of different robots and showed that we could generalize in zero shot to entirely new robotic platforms in many different environments. It's debatable as to whether this represents many tasks because the tasks are all navigation, but the model is goal conditioned and can solve uh, control problems for new robots in new environments in zero shot. We haven't examined fine tuning yet, and that's of course uh, something for future work. But let's start with bridge data and pre-training for robots. So here's a, a problem we can ponder. You get a new robot right out of the box, and you'd like some kind of data set of past interactions that you could load up on your new robot, and maybe it doesn't solve exactly the task you want right away, but it acts as a kind of bridge to bridge the gap between your small data regime and generalization. The bridge data set was intended to address this. It does not support generalization across different robots, but it is aimed at supporting everything else, different tasks and different environments. So the bridge data set uses the WidowX robot and consists of over 7,000 demonstrations in various kinds of household style environments. There are 10 different environments in the training data and over 70 tasks. And it's really designed to be reusable by other researchers in new domains and for new tasks. So the reason to include all these different domains is so that if you have a different setup in your lab, as long as you have the same robot, you could load this up. And of course, a natural direction to extend this is to include other robots, which is something we're working on now. But, for, but today I want to tell you about some experiments we've done with the original WidowX bridge data set to show how it can be used to accelerate acquisition of new tasks. So the, the latest project with the bridge data that I'll, that I'll tell you about is called PTR, or pre-training for robots. And PTR employs offline reinforcement learning as a pre-training engine. So the idea is that there are these different tasks in the bridge data set, and we're going to train a single model that receives the robot's image and a one-hot encoding of the task. The last entry in the one-hot encoding will be reserved for the new task. So pre-training will train on all the entries except for the last one using the bridge data set. And that's going to be pre-trained with offline RL using the, the bridge data set to solve each of these tasks. And then we'll get a small amount of data for the new task. For now, it'll be demonstration data, and we'll get on the order of 10 demonstrations. Very small, not nearly enough to solve the task in zero shot. And then we'll fine tune. During fine tuning, we'll actually still mix in the bridge data set into each batch so that we don't forget. So some portion of the batch is reserved for old data and some is reserved for the new task data. And the new task gets to use that last entry in the one hot conditioning vector. So that's the setup. It's very simple. It's basically using offline RL, in this case CQL, to pre-train, and also using offline RL to fine tune for the new task. It turns out that if we do this, we can actually master new tasks with as little as 10 demonstrations. So here are a few examples. Here we have a door opening task, which is present in the bridge data set, but our goal will be to learn to open a very different door in a very different environment, in this case, a microwave door. We'll get 10 demonstrations. We'll take this offline RL pre-trained model, and then we'll fine tune it with offline RL on those demonstrations. And if we do this with PTR, we get a success rate of 60%. If we do the same thing with behavior cloning, we get 50%. So it's, it improves on behavior cloning a little bit. But interestingly, on the far right, you can see target data only. If you only have the data from this target domain, then the success rate is a lot lower. So there's a very large improvement from using the pre-training in this case. Here's a, an even harder setup. Here we're going to have an entirely new task, in this case, putting this cucumber in the pot. And we'll use the bridge data for pre-training, uh, but it doesn't have this task even in a different environment. Uh, in this case, PTR does quite a bit better uh, than all the alternative methods. And if we're training only on target uh, domain data, that's the uh, second group from the left, it basically doesn't work. And if we're using non-robotic pre-training like R3M or MAE, then these things also really don't work. So you really need to pre-training on robotic data. It's not that these prior methods are not good, it's just that the, not, the amount of data you have for the new task is so very small that you really need the pre-training to essentially learn a wide range of manipulation behaviors rather than just visual representations. We've also been able to show that PTR actually improves performance as you use larger and larger models. So the bridge data set only has on, on the order of thousands of demonstrations, not hundreds of thousands. But even at this scale, we can see that larger models like ResNet 18, ResNet 34, and ResNet 50 lead to consistently better performance when using this offline RL pre-training. Uh, of course, adding more data will probably allow us to reap even more benefit from scale, and we're increasing the size of the bridge data set all the time. But this is a very favorable indication for the, uh, the power of robotic pre-training 
in this case with reinforcement learning. It's also worth noting that the original bridge dataset was not collected for offline RL in mind. The bridge dataset was actually created as a general purpose dataset of demonstration data, initially tested with imitation learning. So it's pretty interesting to see that once we have this dataset, we can start experimenting with different strategies and discover the kinds of algorithms that work best for offline RL, in this case, discovering, uh, sorry, that work best for robotic pre-training, in this case, discovering that offline RL actually performs better than imitation learning, despite the existence of uh, demonstration data. Okay, but so far, we had a model that couldn't really be prompted in zero shot to perform a new task. You really needed to supply some amount of data for the new task and then fine tune before you could get it to do anything. In the next project, uh, we're actually going to aim to get some zero shot capability and have that natural lead into fine tuning autonomously to improve the capability further. So the idea is that we're going to use the same bridge data set, but now we're going to train a goal condition policy that takes in the current observation and a goal image and attempts to reach that goal image. We'll also train a state encoder and an affordance model. And the purpose of these components will be to enable a kind of planning functionality. You can think of the affordance model as a multi-step model in, a, in an abstracted lossy latent space. And if we specify a goal that is too far removed, in this case, moving the knife into the pot and the sushi on the plate, the affordance model can be used to plan sub-goals on the path to the final goal. This is a, important if you want to solve a multi-stage task, but in this case, it'll give us another really important capability, which is the capability to fine tune. So the idea is that you can specify a goal, attempt the task in zero shot, but if you're not happy with it, you can go further. So let me uh, further explain how this works. So we have an encoder that's actually trained end-to-end -end with RL to encode the current state and the goal state. And we have an affordance model that acts in, on the encoded state using an abstract state representation and an abstract multi-stage latent action representation. So you can think of this as a higher level hierarchical model and that's used to construct plans, basically individual sub-goals that the low-level goal condition policy can take to reach a final temporarily extended goal. And those sub-goals are given to the goal condition policy. But when we actually command a goal in a new domain, we might get into a situation where the goal condition policy does not succeed at accomplishing that goal. However, the affordance model might still succeed in producing reasonable sub-goals. Intuitively, the robot might not know how to pick up this particular knife, but it's pretty sure that if the knife goes in the pot and the sushi goes in the plate, then it should pick up the knife first and then the sushi. So the sub-goals from the affordance model might actually be reasonable. We'd expect it to generalize more broadly because it's operating on a more abstracted space. But the goal condition policy may not always generalize in zero shot, in which case it can use those planned sub-goals to actually fine tune, but now the fine tuning is autonomous. It wouldn't actually require a person to provide demonstration data or anything of the sort. It would just use reinforcement learning to fine tune using the plan generated in zero shot by the affordance model. And that's one of the powerful things you can do with robots, with something like uh, language models or clip. You know, you can generalize in zero shot, but if you fail to generalize, you don't really have much recourse. You have to basically get additional supervised data. But with a robot, maybe you generalize just enough so that you can fine tune autonomously. You still need data, but now the data can be collected by the robot on its own. So here's a task uh, where the robot has to move the pot and then put the bunny in the pot. If we just run model free RL on this, it can master the first stage of the task, but not the entire task. In zero shot, our method flap actually doesn't do that much better. So it puts the pot roughly in the right spot, but then doesn't really manage to pick up the bunny. And you can see that the robot is trying to do the right thing, which means that the affordance model did produce the right sub goals. You can see the gripper almost mimes an action where it tries to put the bunny in the pot, but hasn't grasped it. So it's really a failure of the low level policy, not the affordance model which means that after autonomous fine tuning, the robot can actually perform the entire task uh, at about 75% success rate. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, we got into a situation where we can specify a task in zero shot and we can further fine tune and the fine tuning is actually autonomous. Here's another task, place the sushi on a plate and drop the knife in the pan. Again, model free RL doesn't really do the task. Out of the box, flap can do part of the first stage, but then after fine tuning, flap can do the whole thing about half the time. All right, so so far everything was on single robots, but let's now talk about multi-robot training. And here we're going to go to, into a navigation setting uh, to see if we can train one policy to control many robots. Now, of course, training one policy to control many robots for navigation is arguably easier because all of these navigation tasks involve first-person observations, and even though the robots might be different mechanically, you know, they're all going to be driving robots that can you know, go forward, left and right, that sort of thing. So we did choose the navigation domain intentionally because it gives us a gentler introduction to multi-robot learning. The question we posed is, can we create a data set and model that can generalize in zero shot, 
to control entirely new robots. So the setup is that, very much like in FLAP, we have a goal condition policy. So the policy is going to take the current observation, OT, and a goal image, OG. It's going to featureize both of them using a mobile net v2 encoder, and then it will predict the temporal distance to the goal, basically the number of time steps, and the action to take to get there. And it will actually use a shared abstraction uh, for the action space for all of the different robots we train on, which is going to be essentially a waypoint in the inertial frame of reference. The model additionally takes a little temporal context, labeled here as the embodiment context. That's not nearly as fancy as it sounds. All it is is a, a concatenation of several recent frames and the actions that were taken. And so you can basically think of it as a, a little bit of a history. And that will be used by the model to determine the capabilities of the current robot that it's driving. So if it sees that the robot is driving very quickly or if it's taking sharp turns, it can infer what type of robot it is. And that'll be really important for generalization. So the tasks are all going to be goal-reaching tasks. We're going to specify a goal with an image, again, just like in FLAP. Uh, and if the goal is very far away from the current location, we'll actually use a graph search procedure. So we'll build a topological graph using images we've seen before in this environment. We'll use this single model to construct edge weights in this graph. So it's not a spatial graph. There's no GPS location or anything like that. It's just entirely made out of images. And the general navigation model is what's going to provide edge weights on this graph. We'll do a graph search and then navigate to the first node. This kind of topological graph approach has been studied pretty widely in image-based robotic navigation. So this is not a new contribution of this work. We're just using it to, to enable this model to navigate to faraway goals. But the key thing that we're testing is, can we get this one model that will generalize in zero shot to entirely new robots? So we're going to train on eight different data sets, which contain six different robots. And these robots really range quite widely in terms of their size and capability. It includes full-size ATVs. Uh, it includes a legged robot, the Spot, the Warthog, which is a larger ground robot, the Turtle Bot, which is an indoor robot, the Jackal, which is a smaller outdoor robot, and even a small-scale RC car. So there's, and the range in speeds is also enormous. So the full-size vehicle drives at 10 meters per second. The Turtle Bot drives at half a meter per second. So there's a lot of variability here. Uh, and then when we train this model, on all of these robots combined, we're going to try to generalize in zero shot to entirely new robots. Now the model doesn't get anything except for that uh, little temporal context to tell it what robot it's, is driving. It's entirely trying to generalize across all the robots. There's no domain adaptation, no special transfer, pure generalization. The resulting model can do some pretty remarkable things. So we can introduce a little bit of, uh, I guess, physical damage. So here there's a stick stuck in the tire. Uh, if we just do open loop control, the stick causes the robot to veer off course. But if we use our model to control the robot, it'll generalize to the tire damage simply because the robot with a damaged tire just looks like a slightly different robot. So if you generalize across robots, then you can manage it. Here, we took a turtle bot robot and we mounted the camera at multiple different heights. And this does produce pretty significant variability in the images that the robot sees. But because the model was trained on many different robots, you know, the camera placement on the ATV is certainly far more different than this, then with all three camera placements, the robot has no trouble navigating to the desired goal image. And perhaps most surprisingly, we can actually generalize in zero shot to fly a quadrotor. There were only ground vehicles in the training set, but as long as you restrict the quadrotor to fly at a fixed height, despite the difference in the camera observation, the camera shaking and all that stuff, it actually generalizes just fine without any additional fine tuning. So just to conclude, I talked about how we could move toward general data sets and models. And of course, the story is not complete. Ultimately, what we would like to have is this setup where you get a new robot, you take it out of the box, and you can just load up some data set, some pre-trained model to act as a bridge to bridge the generalization gap, get it to do something in zero shot, and then fine tune from there, hopefully autonomously. The thing is, if you can do that, then and people start using this kind of model, and you can collect the data that they gather during the autonomous fine tuning, then the size of the data set will grow and grow. So perhaps unlike in other fields, you can actually start small and grow from there as long as you hit some initial critical mass to make the model useful. As long as you contain behaviors for many different robots, different tasks and different environments, as long as you can condition on some notion of a goal and your model is well suited for fine tuning and generalization. Thank you very much for listening.